That's better. It just it seemed a bit darker than I, I remember. <laughs> so our final themed session will focus on resilience. We're going to be examining how new technologies provide better ways of predicting, preventing, and responding to natural disasters and preparing ourselves for future extreme events, terror strikes, pandemics, climate shocks. We'll also explore how these new technologies can bring new dependencies and new threats. So our resilience panelists, starting from the, the far end, uh, Jo De Silva, who will be our keynote speaker. Uh, she's Director of International Development at Arup, and uh, she'll be talking first, uh, followed by Professor Robert Mayer, who is Head of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Jianyong Zhang, who is president of Nanjing Hydraulics Research Institute. Bran Ferrell, chief creative, creative officer at Applied Minds. And Dr. Paul Golby, chair of the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and non-executive director of the National Grid. So I'd like to invite Joe De Silva to deliver the keynote speech. Good afternoon. Um, it's a real privilege to have this opportunity to talk to such an informed audience um, and a global audience, um, and particularly alongside such an illustrious panel. Um, my talk is really provides an introduction to this session, which is on the theme of disasters. And happily, uh, this year, I'm giving the Institution of Civil Engineers Brunel Lecture. And the theme of that um, I chose was shifting agendas from response to resilience, um, which provides a context, I think, for some of the things that some of the other speakers are going to say. Natural disasters are a very significant issue, but they're something we read about in the newspapers and tend to move on and ignore. The reality is that over the last 10 years, uh, they affected more than 2 billion people, and annually, the cost of natural disasters is around 100 billion US dollars. To put that into con context, that's the infrastructure budget for Africa, the bailout of an American bank, um, and twice the GDP of a country like Sri Lanka. And although earthquakes uh, co still cause the biggest deaths, and that's despite huge advances, advances in countries like Japan and the US in terms of codes of practice, um, they actually only represent about 4% of the disasters that happen. Um, and the sad reality about earthquakes, which we saw very well illustrated in Haiti, is that there's towns and cities all around, all around the world which are disasters simply waiting to happen because of the poor quality of building construction and the lack of regulations. But although earthquakes cause the highest mortality rates, it's floods that affect the most people. Um, this was starkly illustrated in Pakistan in 2010 when an area the size of Italy was covered by floodwaters and 12% of the population was affected. Um, the reality is that that happened again the following year in 2011. And we've just seen Hurricane Sandy in America. Last year, it was the floods in Bangkok, the previous year flooding in Brisbane. And cities have been brought to stand, a standstill by floods. And floods, droughts are all part of the sort of suite of weather-related hazards that are affected by climate change. Uh, there's a question mark here simply because I gave this presentation in America last week. Um, <laughs> but the evidence is overwhelming. Floods, storms, droughts are on the increase. Uh, the Americans claim that this is actually due to telecommunications and that we can report these events more readily. Um, but I would beg to disagree. Um, there are, of course, other issues that do come into play, uh, such as environmental degradation um, and rapid urbanization, which I'll come on to in a minute. But in the 1990s, when disasters were recognized as a global challenge, the concern was that they were actually um, deleting the hard-won development gains. And so UN agencies were very active in creating, uh, setting up 19, the 1990s as the decade of disasters and initiating action around the world to put this subject on the agenda. But today, the concern 
is money. Disasters are an economic issue, and as you can see from this graph, the cost of disasters is rising rapidly. The key reason for this is simply because disasters are occurring in urban areas, and therefore these increasing costs represent the loss of physical assets. The cost of the Japanese earthquake and tsunami is totaled at around 300 billion US dollars, making it the most costly disaster in history. And if I extended this graph by one more year, um, you know, I'd be off the scale. Um, but countries like Japan, although it represents a significant um, economic impact, um, it's nothing compared to the impact of disasters on countries like Haiti, where the, the cost of the disaster was only 8 billion US dollars, but that was more than the GDP of the country. And chronic poverty, weak governance, um, and that economic cost mean that it's going to take decades for Haiti to recover. So these are an issue, disasters are an issue that we need to take very seriously. Um, my focus has been on where are these trends leading, leading us to, um, and what, what do we need to worry about in the future? And I think this is the big issue. This photo is actually of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, but I could have found pictures of many cities in the world that have been inundated by floods or collapsed as a result of earthquakes. We live in a world that is increasingly urban, and by the middle of this century, about 70% of people are going to be living in urban areas. And we've seen disasters affect cities from Christchurch in New Zealand due to earthquakes to the flooding in Bangkok, where the implications of that disaster were felt globally. Bangkok is a center of manufacturing for computer hardware, for car manufacturing. And as a result of the flooding in Bangkok, the cost of hard drives went up by 10% globally. And Toyota's car production slowed in five countries, including Venezuela, which is the other side of the world. Um, and this is interesting because urban disasters are putting this subject on the business agenda. But urban disasters are complicated um, because they're a consequence of three key things. The first is simply that cities um, have historically been located in areas that are highly exposed to disasters because they're on the coasts because of proximity to, to trade routes or they're in deltas because of access to fertile land. Um, and this graph shows the top 20 cities um, in terms of their exposure for weather-related hazards. Um, and these are some of the biggest cities in the world, um, and this doesn't include um, sea level rise. Um, but it's not just the accumulation of people and assets in areas that are highly exposed. A bigger issue is also the rapid pace of urbanization. And the fact that urbanization is happening in South, Southeast Asia, and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. And in these places, uh, financial resources, effective governance, and political will are lacking. And therefore, the consequence is unplanned urban development that's characterized by infrastructure deficits, poor quality buildings, and deteriorating ecosystems. Whether it's runoff from new developments, destruction of coastal ecosystems to build roads, lack of investment in stormwater drainage, inadequate watershed management, all of these things are massively cre are creating risk in the urban environment. And of course, the people that are most effective are the poor, who are, tend to be located, such as here, on marginal land. Um, and already one billion people live in informal settlements, and unfortunately that is a number that's rising. So I think a challenge for us as engineers is actually to think very specifically about how can we reduce the risks for the poorest one-tenth of the population. Urban areas, though, create, um, mean, I think, a completely different approach to thinking about disaster management. They're characterized by complexity. Large numbers of, living in close pro large numbers of people who are living in close proximity, and they're dependent on the urban system, the institutions, the infrastructure, the knowledge networks that allow the city to function. And so it's not just a case of an overlay of hazards on vulnerable populations, which is traditionally how a lot of disaster um, management has been approached. Actually, what we need to look at is the impact of those hazards on the urban system. If a power station goes down as a result of sea level rise because that power station's on the coast, 
and you've got centralised energy infrastructure, the whole energy supply in the city is likely to fail. If that energy is responsible for the telecommunications networks and the radio links, people won't understand what's happening because the radio stations will go down. And if the water is being pumped from kilometres away, which is the reality in many cities, the water supply may also go down. The reality of this is it makes it very difficult for us to predict and therefore prevent uh, urban disasters. Overlaid on this is another challenge, climate change. And this, I think, brings considerable uncertainty. Uh, there's estimates of how many more people are going to be affected by climate change in the next four to five years. But actually, there is no scientific consensus and we increasingly realise that a lot of the scenarios are non-conservative. The, therefore, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and as this diagram shows, um, the issue of climate is very in, intimately linked to the issue of disasters. And climate change adaptation, which is about tackling the local implications of climate change, um, is critical. Um, it's much more complicated than mitigation because it's context-specific, and it also is a function of not only increasing hazards, like uh, the intensity of storms increasing, but also new hazards, like um, glacial lake outflow flooding, GLOF it's known as, which is when ice dams uh, melt in the Himalayas, releasing huge amounts of water, or changes in vector-borne diseases in tropical countries, uh, so there's more dengue, more malaria. Um, but it's also because underlying vulnerability is affected by climate change in terms of things like water scarcity. All of this means that we have to approach things in a different way. Our ability to understand and model the dependencies and interdependencies in an urban system is limited, and there are valiant attempts by engineers to build computer models that model these complexities. Um, but I have yet to see a computer model that actually effectively models human behaviour, particularly human behaviour in an emergency. Um, but also uncertainty, which challenges traditional risk management practices that have tended to be hazard specific and are, have, are based on a predict and prevent paradigm. If we don't really know what's going to happen over the next 50 years, it makes it very challenging to design the infrastructure on which we depend. And this is where resilience comes in. Resilience is a paradigm shift away from the traditional areas of response, preparedness and prevention. And this, there's lots of definitions of resilience, but actually I find this word cloud that we did based on 30 documents um, much more helpful because it highlights the two really important things about resilience, which is that it's about the ability of systems to perform and to deal with disruption. And really, that's what resilience is about. Um, it's about you know, the ability of systems to perform so the disruption doesn't result in collapse and breakdown. Um, and this is very different to, to the, way we things, the way that we have approached things in the past. The goal is to create safer and more resilient communities at every level of society, who understand the risks they face and are able to prepare, withstand and recover from catastrophic events and the accumulating stresses that are likely due to things like climate change. Inherent in the notion of resilience is acceptance that disruption may occur and that it may result in significant change, but what matters is that you can continue and that the well-being of people is maintained. I was speaking in New York a couple of weeks ago um, and there is sort of denial that Hurricane Sandy might ever happen again, but the reality of course is that it will. Um, it'll have a different name, we might be on C or D with the alphabet a few times round, but what matters is not that New York may get hit by another hurricane but actually what can be done now in New York to ensure that the consequences of the next hurricane are less severe and those consequences are contained. Um, this is a diagram from some work that we've been doing with New York City, um, highlighting five building blocks of resilience in terms of redundancy and flexibility, which are challenging because they actually go against some of the sustainability agendas of efficiency 
and these two concepts need to be brokered, but also the importance of safe failure, rapid rebound, and constant learning. So I just want to quickly throw in six um, suggestions of how we might, as engineers, tackle this. The first is to shift towards a systems perspective, to not look at what we do as on a project-by-project -project basis or in isolation as engineers, but to recognize that what we do links to ecosystems, to people, to institutions. And these are themes that other speakers have talked about over the last day or so. We also need to accept failure. Um, engineers are not om omnipotent, although actually that is the perception um, of a lot of the public. Uh, when failure occurs, it's not very often, but it can be catastrophic. We saw that with the levees in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. We saw it with the failure of the Fukushima plant um, in Japan. And therefore, when we're designing, to design to thresholds after which failure will be catastrophic is, is not really um, a viable way forwards, uh, something that the seismic community um, have already addressed. Codes and practices, regulations, rules are vitally important. And the, sh the change um, in countries like Japan, uh, the change in the impact of earthquakes as a result of the introduction of those codes is really stark. And countries like Chile introduced codes for seismic risk in the 1960s. And although the earthquake in Chile was as big, in fact, bigger than the earthquake in Haiti, the loss of life was trivial. And that was directly a consequence of codes and planning regulations and good engineering practices. But the reality is that many of the most vulnerable countries in the world, codes don't exist. If they do, like in Indonesia, they don't apply to simple single-storey buildings like schools and health centres. And they're only effective if they're part of a culture of safety that includes engineering education and enforcement. So I advocate that as much emphasis needs to go on just promoting safer construction practices, building on how people create the infrastructure around them already looking at what people do and using our engineering knowledge to improve it rather than provide, propose an alternative uh, pathway to comply with a code which, which may be very tricky. This is on the theme really of appropriateness. Um, I am awed by the ingenuity of the engineering profession. And when you look at disasters, you know, we, we build some of the tallest buildings in the world in countries like the Philippines, which are highly vulnerable to earthquakes. We build heroic structures like the Thames Barrier to protect London. Um, and that is one of a whole series of flood defenses uh, with a value of nearly 10 billion US dollars. But the reality for most of these cities that are highly vulnerable to sea level rise is that that is a bill that they will never afford. And there also isn't the technical capacity locally to design, operate and maintain this kind of infrastructure. So in cities like Ho Chi Minh, we need to be thinking in a different way, thinking about the cumulative effect of smaller interventions, which can be adapted as we learn more in the future. And I'm talking about things like water retention, like sustainable urban drainage systems. And these are newer practices in urban design, which are increasingly coming in to the world in Europe and the US but when I travel in Africa and Asia, um, they are frequently absent. Um, and the default is to borrow more money from the World Bank and build another dike. I'll just skip that one because we're short of time. I, I think the final thing I just wanted to say was, was the importance of business and the business case for this. Uh, it's very easy to sit in our ivory towers um, and intellectualize subjects like uh, disaster risk. But if we can make them a business reality, I believe that they will really happen. Uh, this is a picture is of a car manufacturing facility in Turkey, and the black line is the fault line where the 1919 earthquake happened. Um, being a Japanese manufacturer, their brief in designing this uh, facility was please ensure that it's operationally critical so that we can open our business a day or so after the earthquake. And when the earthquake happened, which happened rather sooner than they expected, um, 
the buildings and all the equipment therein performed you know, as designed. But what everyone had overlooked, including the engineers, was that that facility relied on people to operate it. And those people lived in poor quality housing nearby, which had collapsed. And the facility remained closed for a month. Um, so this story I tell because I think it illustrates a business case for disaster risk reduction. And I think we as engineers have a very big role to play in helping articulate that business case so we can engage a wider group of people in this debate. This is my final slide, which is about rising to the challenge. That challenge has already been articulated. In 2005, 168 governments signed the Hyogo Framework for Action. And in 2011, they conducted a midterm evaluation to see what progress was being made globally towards reducing re disaster risk. Um, I read that report with interest. It highlighted three areas that required urgent attention where nothing had been done. The integration of risk reduction into infrastructure projects, safer schools and hospitals, and addressing urban risk. Miraculously, when I scanned through the document on a word search, the word engineer, engineering, was notably absent. And when I looked in the bibliography of co um, contributors, there were no engineers, a few urban planners. So I think if we are going to rise to this global challenge, and I do think that we as a profession have a lot of the know-how that's needed, we need to engage more proactively in the debate because by our actions, we'll either compound disasters or diminish them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. I'd now like to invite Robert Mayer to come to the lectern. Well, it's a great pleasure to be speaking this afternoon in this session on resilience. Joe De Silva has uh, very eloquently described the importance of thinking about disaster and, and uh, engineering our infrastructure uh, in the context of potential disasters. I'm going to address this afternoon some new engineering aspects of resilience in the context of our physical infrastructure. And I will, I will briefly describe some of the work I and my colleagues at Cambridge are doing uh, on the subject of engineering resilient infrastructure. This is um, very much part of a large project funded by the EPSRC and the Technology Strategy Board. So there really is no question that whether one's talking about a developing country or uh, a developed country, that high quality national infrastructure is absolutely essential for supporting economic growth, uh, productivity, uh, attracting globally mobile businesses, and, of course, for promoting social well-being. And modern construction and infrastructure needs to be optimised in terms of efficiency, in terms of cost, uh, low carbon footprint, and, and service quality. And, of course, very much the focus of this session this afternoon, it needs to be resilient and robust and adaptable to changing patterns. And by those changing patterns, we, of course, primarily think about climate change and natural hazards. It needs to be innovative, of course, across all sectors, driven by business in partnership with governments. So what I'm going to be talking about is some of the newest thinking as to how our construction industry and how uh, infrastructure can be uh, changed in quite radical ways. Firstly, we've heard quite a lot already from Joe about the vulnerability of our infrastructure. And there are just four examples here. There, of course, are hundreds, hundreds more. But... Um, I want to focus on these just to illustrate some important points. The one on the top left um, and the one on the bottom right are examples which we're all familiar with of uh, our existing infrastructure actually being a lot more vulnerable than we realize as engineers and as operators. 
So whether it be a bridge collapse in Minnesota, which was very tragic, uh, resulting in, a, in loss of life, or whether it be a high-pressure water main bursting with enormous cost implications, we have a lot of infrastructure in our urban environments which are extremely vulnerable, and we may not realize it. The example on the top right is an example of vulnerability during construction. This was a station for a new metro being constructed in Singapore, which collapsed uh, without much warning and uh, resulted in loss of life and enormous cost, running into uh, many, many tens of millions of dollars. And the one on the bottom left, of course, is another example of what Joe was showing earlier of vulnerability to uh, flooding. And this was a, a photograph uh, taken of an electricity substation in this country uh, in 2007 as a result of uh, really uh, rapid um, and unexpected levels of flooding. Now, The Economist uh, uh, magazine got interested in this subject um, a, a couple of years back and they came in fact and talked to us at Cambridge and they ran a whole uh, article, uh, quite a large article, about smart infrastructure. And they recognised the interest and importance of having urban, uh, urban infrastructure equipped with sensors using the latest technologies to actually tell us an awful lot more about how our infrastructure is performing, uh, both in the terms of old, existing infrastructure, whether they be bridges or tunnels or, or uh, anything else, but also how we can actually improve hugely the process of constructing and producing our infrastructure, which is, after all, a very, very expensive business. And indeed, uh, this reflects my own personal interest more in that uh, a lot of what I do is, is concerned with underground infrastructure. But there is more and more the likelihood that many of our large cities of the future will be making increasing use of underground space. And this is a proposal that's being put into practice quite soon in the Tokyo station area, making much, much more radical use of underground space. But in order to do that, we need to understand much more about uh, what we can do and, and how we can do it, and we need to be using some new technologies, particularly sensor technologies, to tell us that. So I'm going to give you a, a brief uh, overview of several aspects of what we've been uh, concerned with at Cambridge. The first is in terms of innovative distributed strain fiber optic sensing. Now, many of you will be familiar with fiber optic sensing using fiber brag gratings, where one can put uh, specific gratings at certain points along an optical fiber to measure strain at discrete points. But there are now very exciting new developments whereby one can, by using um, uh, distributed strain Brillouin uh, techniques, by uh, shining a light source down the optical fiber and measuring the backscattered uh, uh, signal, one can actually get the strain continuously all the way down the optical fiber. And <clears throat> one example of this recently has been an installation in a London underground tunnel to monitor and interpret joint movements in that tunnel. And you can see here in the photograph the very um, the, the, the white optical fiber which has been stretched um, along the tunnel. And we can get the complete strain distribution all the way along that optical fiber. And, has, and that has informed in a way that's never been done before as to exactly what the mechanism of movement uh, on this particular tunnel is. And this is a tunnel of some concern, but I should reassure you, particularly our visitors, visitors here today, that the entire London Underground system is safe, but this particular section has got some unexplained <laughs> movements going on. And this use of optical fibers in a completely novel way to understand old infrastructure is a very uh, exciting technology. And the Crossrail project, which is a huge, uh, it's the largest civil engineering project in Europe at the moment, here in London, involving uh, many kilometers of new tunnels and stations, 
and there are some very large bits of underground infrastructure, and the same process is being used. So the reinforcement cage, which you can see being lowered um, from a crane on the top left um, down to depths of about 50 meters below the ground, provides a perfect vehicle for attaching optical fiber to the reinforcement cage. And on the right-hand side, you can see there's optical fiber shown both in red and in green, and it's very cheap. The actual cost of the fiber is not at all expensive, and so we can now get a completely new understanding of the forces, and the, well, the strains, and therefore the forces operating on these deep, expensive, buried structures, and already we are finding that these, these have been designed in a much too conservative way. And so there are big economies that could be made, but still ensuring that the infrastructure remains robust. MEMS sensing has also been used in a, in a quite different way for the construction industry and for infrastructure. So there are all manner of um, very smart and clever technologies to do with MEMS, which many of us are familiar with. Uh, and you can see, for example, on the bottom right-hand corner, there is a, a, uh, a strain gauge, which you'll see what looks like two tuning forks. And so if, uh, if they, that particular device uh, undergoes some kind of strain, then the frequency of the tuning fork changes. And this is a very accurate and extremely useful way of, of measuring strain, which we're now implementing uh, on uh, a number of examples, including the Prague Metro, where they have got quite a lot of cracks. It sounds as if I'm only showing you tunnels that are in trouble, but in, in Prague, they do have some problems there, and these MEMS sensors have really changed the way in which the owner and operator of the metro can understand what's happening to, the, to their infrastructure. And, of course, we're in a world of wireless networks, and that's changing things enormously because, again, in the context of tunnels, but it doesn't only apply to tunnels, it applies to flood defences or bridges many other forms of our physical infrastructure where wires leading from gauges uh, are extremely troublesome and, and uh, not, not at all desirable. But now we can have the, the principle of, of placing sensors of the right type into or onto our infrastructure and they can take readings and they can beam their data to the adjacent sensor right on through to a gateway and from that gateway to a mobile network. And so, properly designed, these can make an enormous difference to how we understand our infrastructure. And uh, here again is the London Underground Tunnel, and uh, what was done here was to place, you'll see there's a gateway uh, shown there, and then a number of different devices, um, all uh, wireless devices to measure cracks and inclination, placed at different places along the tunnel, and then uh, they, what they can do, as I showed in the previous diagram, they can then beam their data from each device to the gateway and to the engineers. And this is enormously attractive to uh, infrastructure owners. So there is a, a very big um, uh, win here because lots of our infrastructure, as I said earlier, is very old. But the question is, how is it performing? Is it good for another 10, 20, or 50 years? We can actually understand that now by using these technologies. Batteries are a problem in that they tend to have to be replaced. And so what we're also working on at Cambridge is using innovative power harvesting, such that the sensors that I've been describing uh, will not need any batteries. And uh, here is one particular example uh, using um, parametric resonance concepts, which we've developed, where the actual vibration of the particular tunnel in question or a bridge if there's traffic driving over it will be sufficient to generate enough power to be stored in capacitors to be able to power the sensor. So one has the prospect very soon of having wireless sensors that may not, uh, will not need batteries because they can harvest their power, not only from um, vibrations, but possibly also from, from wind 
uh, and for solar and other forms of energy. So, just in summary, um, this is obviously only a very brief uh, description I've given you. Firstly, there are some hugely big uh, developments on distributed strain, optical fibre systems, which are very versatile and they're widely applicable. Uh, one can, I know of one example in Japan where uh, highway embankments, which are rather thought to be rather unstable in one part of Japan, there are simply kilometres of optical fibre being used and at very low cost, but with enormously new uh, understanding of what those embankments are doing. Embedded MEM sensors, uh, are, they're low power and low cost and high resolution. Wireless communication, easy to install, robust networks, and, and finally, the prospect of power harvesting, where we can use miniature power harvesting devices and we can use low-grade energy which is available in our environment, such as vibration, wind, pressure fluctuations, and, and even heat. <clears throat> so coming back finally to that article in The Economist, um, they finished up by saying uh, the quotation you'll see on the right-hand side there, that if a car can be made smart enough to spot when the oil is low or a brake light has failed, why not do the same for bridges tunnels and buildings. And of course it's not only bridges, tunnels and buildings uh, as suggested by The Economist. Uh, this applies to many, if not all, uh, aspects of our physical infrastructure. It could be critical pipelines, flood defences, nuclear power stations, potential landslides. The list is endless. Uh, and now is the time for us to, to engineer a smart intelligent, uh, more economic, but resilient infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. I'd now like to invite Dr. Jiang Yung Zhang to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure uh, to attend this summit. My topic today is about water security. It, uh, it is, will be focused on the three points, water issues and new challenges with environment change, and what shall we do next. So is the water security is so important? Yes, it is. First of all, the water is the source of the life. As we know, about 60% of our body is water. Everybody drinks a lot of water every day. So we need sufficient clean water to drink. The global population is more than 7 billion billions. So for the global the food security, we need to plant water for irrigation. Second, on the other hand, the water may be bring us the natural disasters in different way. As we know, many people die due to the flood every year in the world. So from this pipe diagram, we can find that the flood and the drought economic loss it, in China, take about 70%, 71% of that caused by the natural disasters. And uh, the flood is the big issue in China. About two thirds territories is under the throat of the flood. The economic loss caused directly by the flood take about 1.8% of the GDP of the same term from 1991 to 29. So this number is about six times of, of American. So what shortage is another big problem of the, in China. In January, the normal year, the water shortage is about 40 million kilometers. And among the six, uh, 600 middle and large cities, 
there are about more than 70 cities with the surveyed water scarcity. Therefore, the water resources become an important factor which restricted the social and economic development in China. So the water disasters represented the most frequent and the most damaged natural disasters, disasters affecting human, human society. So let's move into new challenges. Before we talk about challenges, let's talk about what kind of the environment change caused the new challenges. First, the temperature. From the IPCC R4 report, in the last 100 years, the temperature of the globe rising about 0 0.74 degrees. But in, in China, it was 0 0.8 degrees, a little bit higher than globus. The second, the precipitation. From these maps, we can find the precipitation in downstream of the Yangtze River in the middle of China and the west part of China, it, it, the precipitation increased. But in the, in the north part of China, where it's dry areas, the precipitation decreased in the last decades. decades. Corresponding the precipitation change, the surface water resources dropped down in the north part of China. For example, in the Heihe River basins, where the Tianjin, Beijing, and the, uh, Hebei province. The water surface, the surface water resources dropped down about 40.48% 40, 40, since 1990s. So it's a lot. It is seems that we have the more and the more extreme events in the last dec decade. For example, the storms hit Beijing almost every year since 2000. So this 2004 and this 2006. So in, during this storm, about the more than 300 uh, floods was canceled. Canceled during the, uh, the, the, the heavy storm. And this is 2007. And this is 2011. You can see this one class woman in the Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square is the biggest, the urban square in the world. And uh, this picture was used yesterday by my uh, US colleagues yesterday morning. So this uh, is the last year, July 24th. The one day rainfall was 540 millimeters. Do you know that? In the Beijing, the annual precipitation only 585 millimeters. So the one day rainfall almost for the, for the, the whole year. So about uh, the 79 people died during the, the storm flood. So this is terrible. So the news line you, on the net net road, if you want to see the ocean, please come to Beijing. Beijing is a far away to the ocean. So what's happened? Why the storms hit Beijing almost every year? Is it because of urbanization? Because of the hot island affecting? Because of the climate change? I think it is integrated influence of them. We also find that George has extended both on a scope and the frequency. So another very, very important change is the sea level rising. From the APPC AR4, the report, the global sea level rising about one to two millimeters per year in the last 100 years. But in China, it was 2.6 millimeters per year in the last 50 years. 
it's, it, it is worse than the globe. So what will be produced by the, uh, above the changes? It is new challenge, there are new challenges for the water security. The first, the impact on the water shortage. From this projected grand runoff by the weak model, using the precinct scenario for the 2030, we can find that it will be dry in the north part of China. So the water shortage will be become more serious in the north part of China. And the second, the flood damage. As we have, we will have more than rainfall in the summer regions, we will have more than urban storms in some city and with the sea levels rising. It is definitely the flood damage will be become seriously. For example, if the sea level rising 10 millimeters around the Shanghai coastal regions, the defense capacity, capacity of the storm tide may be bet by the 10 years in return period. So with the sea level rising, the fresh water area will become the salt, wa salt water in an addition partly, and the concentration of the salt water will be high. Therefore, the engineering structure will be rusted day by day. So what shall we do with those so many new challenges in the future? So action one, to optimize the, the national water resources and allocations and enlarge the water supplies capacity. So this map is a trans, uh, water transfer project which transfer water from the Yangtze River to the north part of China. So we have the three lines. The east lines will be finished the, uh, on end of this year and the middle line will be finished the next year. So action four to construct more the reservoirs to increase the capacity of the storage and the, water, uh, and the supplies of water. So action three to build up water saving society to promote the water use efficiency, including the water saving in the household, the agriculture and the industrial, the waste water treatment and the reuse and the utilization of the rainwater and the flood as the water resources, and also the management. The action for enhance the infrastructure to promote the capacity of the flood defenses, including the dike, the sea wall, the reservoirs. So the action five to building uh, an advanced flood information systems to enhance the non-structure measure, measures for the flood defense, including the rainfall, the flood, the drought monitoring, the forecasting, and uh, the controlling of the flood, uh, the, the water resources. So this is the sketch map we use the, uh, for the decision support systems operated in the National Flood Defense Headquarters in Beijing. So most of the systems uh, are, are developed something in the, these systems. So for the conclusions, so water disasters is the most frequent and the most damaging natural disasters affecting human society. So we have to pay the high attention for the, uh, the water sec security. The second, the climate change and the human activities bring us the new challenges. We face more seriously water, water security issues of the flood defense, water supplies, and the engineering structure, structures. And the third, it is time for us to take the action together for the water security, for the economic and the social development, for our safety and the health. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much.
Okay, next up is Brand Farron. Good afternoon. I'm the next one here to cheer you up. <laughs> and my topic is cybersecurity, starting to become fashionable. Um, at the 100th anniversary of the Grand Challenges Conference, which will be held in Liechtenstein, you can jot that down now, <laughs> the keynote speaker will likely start its talk by noting something I firmly believe today, and that is the internet will turn out to be the most important invention in human history since language. Far more important than reading and writing. I think that's gonna be a fad. I think we have another 250 years or so, and then it's gone. Why? Because it's in our DNA to do storytelling. It's not in our DNA to do reading and writing, and I think it is an abstraction. It will be replaced by a better abstraction. We have seven billion people on the planet, six billion cell phones, soon to become smartphones, soon to become a networked world, the like of which we have never seen before. And the implications of this are enormous, as has been noted. I mean, if you look over here, there's a chart which has appeared in one way or another in everyone's presentation. And by the way, I'm drawing it because it's a more resilient technology and PowerPoint is evil. Uh, <laughs> It's a chart that looks like that, where this is time and this is something important. <laughs> and it looks like that. That's the number of people on wireless mobile internet. It's um, the conversion of bits per second being moved in everybody's house. It's this, it's, it's that, it, it's that. You know, we recall the computer revolution. You can call it the communications revolution, but the sense is something big is happening. And then there's another chart which is drawn, which looks similar to this. The principal difference is this is the computer revolution of which, by and large, none of you were responsible for. Handful of exceptions. This is your job, okay? And whether you're a newspaper publisher and you know this is ad sales, um, et cetera, or you're in one of the thousands of businesses that are being impacted by this revolution every day in a way that we can barely keep up with, your sense is this point where these two curves cross is not a good place to be, right? At which point the speaker gets up and says, and we are here. Great news, a little like the subway tunnel, you know, um, ready to come down on us, at which point a senior member of the group gets up and says, you're an alarmist, you're actually over here. So great comfort, you know, Titanic, the iceberg is actually three miles away rather than one mile away. At which point some young kid, and we never understand why we allow them into these kinds of meetings, um, points out we're actually here and we're such dinosaurs, we're already dead, we just don't know it um, as we're <laughs> moving forward. And we've heard many examples over these two days with excellent speakers about how this whole thing, this whole internet revolution is going to, and computer revolution, because they're, they're inextricable, and I'm going to refer to them interchangeably. Everything today has a computer in it, by and large, and those computers are networked. It's just a given that that's where everything is going. Um, but this computer revolution, to quote American computer scientist Alan Kay, who invented um, overlapping Windows interfaces, um, which you see on every computer now, object-oriented programming with his team at Xerox Park, and this thing called the personal computer, which he conceptualized long. A good person who's had a track record of predicting these things. He teaches a course called The Computer Revolution Hasn't Begun Yet. And I think that's really the seminal point. If you think we have dependencies now, interdependencies between systems that the engineers and designers don't understand, such as GPS, such as networks, such as uh, any of these examples we've heard, um, the computer revolution hasn't begun yet. We're here as compared to the impact that we're going to find in this world. And we can only begin to get the slightest glimpse of it, but the problem, we of the engineers of the world have to deal with this now. And you know, this constant evolution where we're pushing farther and farther ahead, um, why has the internet survived this long? Because there was a brilliance to its authors, many of which are amongst us today, that said we're only going to legislate the lowest level of stuff needed for interoperability. We're not gonna come up with some grand plan to solve all the problems of the world. And as a result, it survived. It's provided easy interoperability. It's provided the ability for people to build devices and systems all over the world without much knowledge of the other ones, just by building to a low level interface. And it's you know, moved forward nicely. Well, the problem is 
that this same flexibility and low-level interoperability and all of that in an internet structure that originally was just great for allowing academics to talk to each other between their universities is now needed to do everything. We heard you know, a compelling example of this. Craig Venter was talking about the software that he built biologically and put into a cell. Took over the cell, the cell went poof, and it became the new organism. Now this is great news for Craig's team and for the um, scientists and science and our knowledge of biology at large. Not such great news for that cell. Okay, if you were the cell that went poof because something you allowed in because it didn't seem strange or foreign to you and you had no mechanism to sense it or protect it, um, your existence ceases to continue. As we look at this, things are becoming possible, self-driving cars. You know, this is a very compelling idea. Um, it's a 50-year-old idea. You will have it within 10 years. Why? Why is it happening now? Because to solve any of the great grand challenges usually takes five or six miracles. Five or six engineering miracles of things you just have to happen. Turns out if you have a compelling and important enough idea, if you simply wait, wait a little while, a lot of those miracles solve themselves. In the way of self-driving cars, cars have to know where they are, what time it is, they got GPS, know what direction they're heading in, they have to know what's happening around them. That requires databases, it requires ubiquitous communications. That happened with the mobile telephone networks accidentally. We thought you had to put wires in the roads. Well, you didn't. It turns out GPS maps with the connection of sensors and vision technology means you don't need to actually change all the highways and that infrastructure. You need a place to put them that the public will accept. We have HOV lanes in many cities, high capacity vehicle lanes, which can be converted to this. And so one by one, ideas that are too hard because it requires too many miracles. In my experience, you get about one and a half miracles. You know, if you really push it, one miracle is good all of a sudden happen. The problem is, because what is the problem here? It's this great world, we're gonna have pacemakers, hearts, we're gonna have these other things all operating by this. The problem is what happens when someone asks all of the million vehicles on the road, why do we have them there? Because they're gonna have a lower carbon footprint, they're going to be safer, they're going to eliminate urban congestion on our roads and highways, they're going to increase productivity of society, and they're going to save lives. Craig mentioned in the United States is the only place I know the statistics, twice as many people die from acquired hospital infections as automobile accidents. If there's a message there, it's if you're in an accident, don't let them take you to a hospital, I guess. <laughs> but the reality is, it is going to happen. It is an inevitability, but what happens if they all turn left? Now, so you just command them all to turn left. Or what happens if all of the airplanes cease flying? Fly-by-wire airplanes are great things, providing the computers are actually working and functioning and connecting. Or how about if the code in your pacemaker is updated and it's a rock rhythm rather than um, something that is a more familiar sinus rhythm? The, the examples are endless. What about the nuclear reactor? There isn't a nuclear reactor that isn't computer control, et cetera, et cetera. And people give themselves a false sense of security that they understand these systems. But the reality is, our systems that we engineer, build, and routinely use today exceeded the threshold of complexity where any one person can understand them. None of you understand how your computers work, really. If you understand how the hardware works, you don't understand the software. If you don't understand uh, any of those, you certainly don't understand the networks and what it's connected to and how. And in fact, nobody understands the configuration of this machine we call the internet and all the computers on it. It's too dynamic, it's too changing, we don't understand it. So, what do we do? Well, the implications of this are enormous, and the implications are enormous whether it's from accidental emergent behavior or people who want to do us harm. Why would anyone do this? Why would people break into the internet, break into your computer, do things? The motivations are usual. Sometimes it's intellectual curiosity. That was the hacker trend is that I came from. It used to be a compliment to be called a hacker, incidentally. And um, now that there's big money involved, um, it's about money. It's about power, it's about influence, it's about gaining knowledge, it's about gaining advantage. And all of these very Darwinian instincts are alive and well and thriving on the internet. Why haven't we heard a lot about it? Why isn't it talked about? Because frankly, the people getting damaged don't particularly like to get up and tell you they've been damaged. If your bank lost 100 million pounds of your money, they're probably not gonna tell you about it unless they really have to. 
And if the tunnel is getting ready to fall down because um, a whole series of valves were opened and water undermined a set of foundations, you will find out about it, but the owners of the tunnel may not know about it for a long period of time, especially if people running the computers that are doing the sensing and monitoring have control over those computers. So the reality is we have a very fragile existence based upon these networks and computers. And the problem is trust. How do we understand trust? The problem with trust in this world today is we have old world definitions of trust, new modern definitions of trust have yet to happen. If we're going to fix this thing we call the internet, etc., we either need a new one, which is possible at the refresh rates of technology and electronics. If you had a better idea, you could refresh it and migrate over it to it in a reasonable period of time. We need trust models where every piece of hardware has its own identity, which is in hardware. Why do I say in hardware? Because you can't trust software. Software is too complicated, has too many moving parts, and you don't know how to validate that it's the code you think you have in your device. So you have to have a mix of engineered hardware and trusted-ish software that works with it. We have to have a public dialogue and debate about what privacy means. Because if I'm going to have my device positively identify to talk to your device, and it say that it owns me, whether through biometrics or something else, then it has to know who I am. In many areas, there is this common perception that we should be able to be anonymous in everything we do in the internet. Well, you can't do that in the real world. I showed up to this country to be the guests of these great institutions, and I had to prove my identity to get into the country. You buy a house, you have to prove your identity. You do all sorts of transactions, you're asked to prove your identity, but somehow or other we don't think that same sort of trust model has to instantiate itself in the electronic world, and I would put forth to you, it does. You can't have it both ways. We have to be able to design resilient systems where you don't have the plan as we do now to keep your enemy and attacker out. Why? Because they're already in your network and they're not going away. Every single person in this room is part of an institution that is being attacked right now in the cyber domain. You are being probed, you are being tested, you are sometimes being penetrated, you are being exfilled, you are being exploited. If you don't believe me, ask your IT person or people. If they say that isn't true, get new ones. <laughs> so in the face of this, what do we do? And what can these great academies do? I would argue that there is a set of public dialogues which have to take place which are not easy in a world of short attention spans and soundbite sensibilities. To have the kind of extended, in-depth conversation about what internet security means, what privacy means, how we have to change a whole bunch of interests who would rather keep things aligned the way they are now is going to require an extended conversation. There is no one company, entity, or organization that is capable of having that kind of um, conversation, except perhaps these academies together, where you can raise the questions to the public, you can have the sort of debates, you can educate people as to what the issues are and why it matters to them personally, to their families, and to the future. These astonishing wonders that we are talking about ahead of us virtually every one of them depend upon a safe, reliable, resilient, and secure internet. And whether it's your power grid, or whether it's how you communicate, or whether it's what you do in a disaster, or whether it's telemedicine and custom medicine, they all depend upon this working correctly and properly. And the problem is the internet we have now is not good enough. It wasn't built to the type of security and trust standards that are appropriate for today. Why? It was great for back here. It's not great for up there. And so it's time to just roll up our sleeves and engineer and design something better and put it in place. To do that requires a public dialogue. That's one. And it requires a second dialogue, which I would argue is um, a new engineering discipline. We talked about going to the moon. I was inspired by that as a kid. And the people who took us there put a man on the moon and successfully returned them to Earth invented a skill we now call systems engineering to do it. 
Why? Because the complexity thresholds they were dealing with were greater than the engineering disciplines at the time could deal with. They invented the system engineer. The system engineer brings both art and science to the job to come up with both rigor and instinct. And notice it's not a team sport, system engineering. There is one system engineer responsible. There are teams of people who lead their intellect, skills, and capabilities, but one person makes the final decisions. And this system engineering skill is at risk. If you look at the major projects that fail globally at the moment, multi-billion dollar huge projects, they are often failing because of a lack of systems engineering. And this is a dangerously vanishing skill set. I would argue not only do we have to make it our collective priorities to reinstitute it, but I would argue it's time to reinvent it. We need a new class of systems engineering for this information age that is sensitive to people, their needs, the needs of society, at the same time understanding the degrees of freedom technically, and a way to drive the complexity of our systems down, because ultimately this excessive complexity will defeat us. And the ability to have simple, direct solutions that are agreed to globally, so we can all move forward and start realizing some of the promises we've talked about, I believe is our highest priority. I have one slide, which I'd like to show you, just to reinforce the point. Um, that's why I personally need you to do it. Um, that's my daughter, who's three and a half, with the gang she runs. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we talk about how we're going to solve these grand challenges. We're not. We're just going to lay the pathway. She's going to solve them, and her friends are going to solve them. Our job is to give them the tools they need to do that. And if we don't fix this cybersecurity problem, we are going to hamper their ability to do that. We are going to jeopardize their personal safety in a world that is both dangerous as it is exciting and promising. And the ability to execute on any of these things depends that we have an internet that is safe, secure, available, resilient, and reliable in a way that we simply do not have now. I would argue that the greatest good these collective academies can do together, which is why I was so excited to be invited to be here and humbled in the presence of my colleagues, is to use the collective power, intellectual power, and influence that these bodies have to get the dialogue going of why we need a new and more secure environment, to make the hard decisions which will cost money, which will set people back and will go crosswise to many commercial instincts, and to provide that sort of safe and secure environment that allow our kids to grow up to protect themselves, our planet, and life as we know it. Thank you. Thank you, Bran. And our last speaker is Paul Golby. Good afternoon. Uh, I guess in being the last speaker in this session, I'm, I'm tempted to congratulate the organisers for their foresight for organising this conference in a ground floor lecture theatre. I am worried about the people sitting in the balconies, but I understand at least there are no windows for you to jump out of. Uh, what I want to do is to really focus on energy uh, security. In the last decade, we've seen possible glimpses of the future. The London Underground plunged into darkness and not working. Italy being without power for nearly a day. And more recently, 600 million people left without power in India for quite a prolonged period of time. There was no common cause. In London, it was a fuse. In Italy, it was transporting electricity over massive distances. And in India, it was system administration and control. But some possible glimpses of the future. The picture behind me is Lower Manhattan, and that's when the lights were on, at least some of them. And as we all know, Hurricane Sandy, combined with spring tides, took out not only an awful lot of power, but it also took out an awful lot of the gas infrastructure as well. Just to give you an example of that in human terms, um, my company, National Grid, operates part of that infrastructure. On Long Island, we would normally have 300 people. In the aftermath of Sandy, we had 15,000 people trying to restore supply on Long Island. And those of you who come from the United States will know, of course, that there are many ways of getting an invitation into the Oval Office. 
my colleagues in New York tell me that turning the lights off is not to be recommended as one of them. <laughs> so what does this tell us? It tells us that whether we are from a developed country or a so-called developing country, modern society cannot function without energy, particularly without electricity. Because no electricity generally means no gas, no water, and no telecoms. So modern society ceases to operate as we know it. We've always already heard from my Chinese colleague that extreme weather, such as storms and flooding that caused the New York blackout, of course, are likely to intensify and are being seen to intensify around the world. And just following the points made by our last speaker, threats to energy security are not just weather related, they're physical infrastructure related, they're industrial accidents, they're space weather, and they're also cyber attack. I'm pleased the previous speaker drew the diagram, but I have to tell you the, the hackers addressing our control systems for national grid in this country are very much following that curve. They're increasing day by day, month by month, year by year. So there's a whole myriad of issues that we have to address. If that wasn't enough, in steady state, of course, we're changing the energy system in, in a way that we've never attempted before. This curve, of course, I'm sure, curves rather, I'm sure you've seen before, in response to increasing population, increasing demand for energy, and recognising that, that carbon is destroying our planet, we are massively changing or trying to change the energy infrastructure around the world. And this is a challenge that can only be addressed by the successful implementation of technology and innovation. And that innovation is across the whole system. It relates to how we make the stuff, it relates to how we distribute the stuff, and it relates to how customers use the stuff. And so these are many engineering problems, but there are also social sciences involved here because we have to take people with us as we go along this journey. There's no silver bullet in any of this. And I just wanted to illustrate this with, with a couple of, of case studies. I think we recognise that we need to make radical changes in our energy mix. The example I'm using here is a local approach to generating new renewable power, the, the Oyster, developed by a Scottish company and the world's largest working hydroelectric wave energy device. Um, and that's the sort of technology that EPSRC, together with industry, together with the government, uh, is supporting. And so that technology originated from university research, and university research is still a fundamental part of, of how that technology is, is developed. And of course, these developments also add to the local uh, economy in terms of manufacturing and installation of these projects. Uh, just according to a, a recent BBC report, the, the Outer Hebrides wave power could be equivalent to 12 modern nuclear power plants. And that's before the waves started getting even bigger. So there is no lack of opportunity out there, but it does need technical engineering innovation to harness that. And I just use one example there for many different technologies that are being supported by EPSRC. And, and to give you a range that can range from paint that turns glass into solar panels all the way through to nuclear fusion. And we have to look and support across that broad spectrum because, as I've said, there's no silver bullet. But to move on to another um, case study, most of these new technologies are local rather than centralised. And most of them are also intermittent. So that brings all sorts of other challenges. And so one of the holy grails of electricity, how do you store it? Well, this is um, an energy storage plant um, built in, in this country. Um, and it was based on a major collaborative research effort between the UK and China. 
and it's led to a joint international research institute joint, uh, supported by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and EPSRC. And, he, and it currently involves more than 45 researchers and 20 projects. So I think you can start to see that innovation technology really is an international um, activity here. And energy uh, storage solutions are absolutely critical to man manage the fluctuating supply of energy as we move into these more uh, intermittent supply sources. There's another Chinese-UK collaboration with funding um, from both the institutions I've mentioned in developing technology to revolutionise the way electricity is transmitted and distributed via interconnected national power grids. Um, then, resilient networks and systems. What will the, net, the grids look like in 2050? We need to move from mega grids to maybe new micro generation and storage devices. And how will consumers adapt to these changes in network reliability? In this area, the UK and Indian researchers have been investigating how to bridge the urban rural divide by looking at renewable energy technologies to make rural living more sustainable. You've already heard the trend towards urbanisation with 70% of the world's population likely to be living in cities by 2050. And we, we need to look at a major consideration of the interdependencies between these systems and how we, we manage this critical infrastructure both in cities and both in the rural economy. The one thing we know is we can't um, solve these problems with current knowledge and with the technology available today. We need fundamental and ambitious research. And um, whatever these are, we need to work in partnership across disciplines, so mathematics, scientists, social scientists, artists, all working together with engineers. Universities and industry working together to make sure that we take the latest research developments and link them to industry and get them to market quickly. Internationally, the image here shows collaboration involving UK and Chinese universities. And we also need to engage the public on the future of their energy systems and how they interact with it. And so an image there, and I understand we had a rap artist here yesterday, but here is um, EPSRC reacting with young people at a music festival. We need to take people with us. And most importantly, we need to support and develop people with the vision, the networks and the expertise to solve these grand challenges. And if I hadn't gone too quickly, um, I was th th thank you. We're, we're pioneering a new approach in the UK with PhD training, bringing together diverse groups of people around major research, societal and industrial challenges. So this year we'll be investing in another 350 million in new centres for doctoral training to f develop future research leaders in the energy space. Because at the end of the day, it's talented people like this and many of the people actually sitting in front of me here, that we need to solve these global challenges such as energy security. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Paul. Well, one of the grand challenges I've had to grapple with over the past two days is time shortage. Uh, and since I can't, Lorentz, transform into a, another inertial reference frame, there's a bit of physics for you, um, I'm afraid we have no time for Q&A. We did have, I think, 25 minutes, but it's been eaten up. And I say that because we can't enter into the break because the AV guys, I've been informed, need to test the, uh, the link to, 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 to uh, the video link up with Bill Gates. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe we can explore some of the issues in this theme Maybe, possibly, even during the Bill Gates session. We have plenty of time for, for Q&A uh, there, but unfortunately not with, the, with this panel. So please join me in thanking them again for their speeches. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and, and therefore, could I ask you all, so we have a break for coffee, and we resume again at, um, well, if you could be back in here about um, 20, 22, 4. Uh, but if you could all leave the lecture.